All right, yeah, thanks, Dima, and uh, well, thanks, thanks to the organizers for bringing me here to this beautiful location. And um, yes, I would like to give you a brief overview in this first talk today, in the lecture today, on, on quantum simulation using ultra cold atoms, just to bring you up to spec, you know, with what can we do with these systems, what kind of probes do we have, what kind of control and manipulation techniques do we have, and then tomorrow we'll apply that to MBL systems, so then tomorrow it will be, you know, looking what localization phenomena we can measure using these tools, and how we can we probe the, the phenomena that already Dima mentioned a little bit in his talk yesterday. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, my own start into this was uh, really from a more fundamental point of view, trying to use this as a new tool for uh, many body physics. And uh, of course, now this is the whole field of quantum simulation and quantum computing has grown into a huge field with many, many promises, probably many are also not going to come true uh, of the expectations of people. But I think what we all can agree on that it's really a wonderful area to have scientific opportunity for novel understanding, tests and discoveries in quantum many body systems. And I think really this is where I think it is making an impact and is showing that it's really uh, generating a new field and giving us new insights into these systems. And I'll, I'll show you that. So there are of course many platforms that people work in uh, for, for quantum simulation, quantum computing, and they're pretty much uh, very related whether you're doing computing or simulation, doesn't really matter. Both plat all platforms are mostly used for all kind, all these different applications. And so you have the ion traps, for example, you have the superconducting devices like um, Google uh, or Microsoft, for example, oh, sorry, Google or IBM are using. Um, or you have these neutral atom systems where the optical lattice is what I would like to focus on in the lecture today. But you have this new, actually very also exciting platform of these Rydberg tweezers where you can trap atoms in focused laser beams and have them interact via Rydberg-Rydberg interaction, which has turned out to be also a very, very interesting simulation platform, especially for a long-range icing model. So that's naturally what you can uh, realize in these systems and look at the dynamics and the ground states of these uh, models. And it's been a very exciting new platform in the game. So actually for me it's a little bit of uh, an uh, important year this year because it's really 20 years of m at least my <laughs> work that got me started into the field and it was based on the original work of you know uh, Ignacio and Peter and Christoph Bruder actually also involved in that on the superfluid mod transition actually going back to earlier work by Matthew Fisher in 1989 and actually should also mention Thierry's work with uh, uh, Schulz, Jamaki and Schulz on the Bose glass in one dimension. So all these things are connected and for us you know when we realized this 20 years ago, it kind of marked the starting point for this field of quantum simulation, at least of, of strongly correlated phases of matter. It was the first example where you could really engineer a system uh, that had nothing to do with the original system and look at physics, for example, in this case of the strongly correlated electron community. And that's where I think a lot of people also from modern condensed matter physics started to get interested in the field of cold atoms because suddenly it was not only confined anymore to, let's say, gross pedayevsky equation, mean field physics, but suddenly you were in this realm of this strongly correlated physics that you could start to explore. There are about maybe, I think, f over 50 groups worldwide now that are, that are working in this field. So I'd like to give you a little bit of the flavor why people are so excited about this and what the things are that you can do. So, um, so I want to start in the lecture by first telling you a little bit about um, state preparation, engineering, and uh, detection. So what kind of states can we prepare in these systems? How do we detect them? Uh, how can we manipulate them? And then I would like to give you two examples today of some of the interesting physics you can study with this. Uh, so on one, you can do strongly correlated electron physics. And I'll talk about that in 1D and 2D. And then I'd like to cover something uh, more on the dynamic side, which doesn't have disorder, but I think is a, at least for me was a super interesting topic, and maybe the people with a more mathematical physics background will also enjoy that. It is this uh, idea about Kada parisi zhang uh, transport and so that's at least, I th found it very interesting, this connection to, to you know, classical statistical physics that has emerged newly in this quantum setum in the, in the non-equilibrium dynamics. Um, yeah, so all this is going to give you some insight on in how we probe and control the systems. And again, we don't have to make it, as the other lecturer said, we don't have to make it through the entire program. So just if something is unclear, just stop me and interrupt me and ask a question, you know, what, uh, wh what you would like to know and what you'd like to understand better. All right, so let me start with the, with the system, these optical lattices. Here I put up a picture of such an optical lattice. It's uh, created by interference of laser beams. In this case, five laser beams that you interfere uh, 
and uh, uh, in the right angles. And in this case, actually, with these five beams that you interfere with this five-fold symmetry, you get a quasi-crystalline structure of the light field. So that's really the light field that you generate just from optical interference. And the atoms experience this light field as an optical potential. So they either like to sit in the very bright regions or the very dark regions. This depends on the wavelength of light that you're using, whether the potential you generate is repulsive or attractive. And now if you cool your atoms to low enough temperatures that they have energies which are much lower than the potential depth of such an optical lattice potential, you can trap them. You can trap them in free space just in the light field of this optical potential, and eventually they will move in this light crystal. And the thing we are going to be dealing with mostly, if you think about this lattice structure, let me just just a simple 1D case, and you think of the local sites as harmonic oscillators, we're going to mostly be confined to really bringing the atoms to the lowest vibrational state, where they're tunnel coupled to the next lattice site via some tunnel coupling T, and then there can be interactions, which we're going to talk about in a second. So we really cool the atoms down into the lowest band. They can move in from side to side via tunnel coupling. And the typical separations here, that's also interesting, we'll come to that, are on the order of 500 nanometers, half a micron. So actually this is nice because it means you can observe the atoms very nicely with optical techniques in the system. Right? You can just build a good optical microscope to resolve individual lattice site in this crystal and detect where the atoms actually are in this crystal. Also remember, uh, when you have these large uh, distances in the system, uh, the energy scales go down also a lot compared to a real crystal. In a real crystal, this would be angstrom separation. right? Here we're talking about micrometer separation, so 10,000 times larger separations. So also the associated energy scales will go down which means we have to be very cold to get there, but also the associated dynamical time scales will become much slower than in a real solid. So in a real solid, if you want to do dynamics, you know, probably happens on a femtosecond uh, time scale, picosecond time scale, but here everything happens in a millisecond time scale because everything is so dramatically slowed down, which means this is a really good setting for doing dynamics, non-equilibrium dynamics, and we're going to talk a lot about that, how to explore this. Uh, we don't have to really do so much to get very, very good time resolution in observing, for example, single atoms hop from one side to the next and propagate or spins move in this system. So for um, degrees, what, what kind of particles can you load into this? Well, we're loading neutral atoms into this uh, optical lattice, and these atoms, depending on the number of uh, neutrons they have in the core, can be either fermions, uh, neutrons and protons in the core, can either be fermions or bosons, depending on the total angular momentum of these systems. So if we have integer spin, then they are bosons. If we have half integer, then of course fermions. And we can also have mixtures. And one thing I want to remark, and what is quite distinct for this, this system, really being able to directly put fermions into the system and allowing them to move in the system. Okay? So you can actually directly simulate the behavior of strongly correlated electrons because you're really putting fermions into this lattice and you're allowing the fermions to move. And then, of course, when they move around each other is when you pick up the minus one phase shift for an exchange. And uh, that's, of course, what matters uh, for that. And that's quite different from other platforms where you usually would work with spin systems, uh, qubits. You localize your uh, qubits to certain sites. They don't move anymore. They're just spins. And then, of course, you have to pay a dramatic overhead to actually simulate fermionic uh, particles on such a, s a spin, uh, spin based um, quantum computer, for example. So, this is a really big advantage, not, not giving us this dramatic overhead that you have to have on the other systems. So, for if you do want to implement, let's say, two states for an electron up down, there are different options that you have. Uh, for, for example, two spin states. And these could be, for example, two spin states in the hyperfine ground state of your atoms. So imagine here an atom which has this um, f equal 2 and f equal 1 ground state here with the hyperfine state, and we could just single out two of those spin states, and those would be the two spins of our electrons spin up and down. Okay, this would correspond to our spin up and down effectively. And if we constrain population to live only in those uh, two substates, by, for example, splitting off the other states with the um, Zeeman field, uh, we can really ideally realize such a spin one-half system. 
But you're not confined to spin one half, as you can see. You can have multiple spin states. You can also have, you know, um, n spin states in the system. Sometimes they also have different interaction symmetries, SUN symmetry. So you're really not only confined to simulating spin one half, but you can realize also higher spin symmetries in the system. Another option you can use, which is very popular actually on the optical clock transition, you don't need to use ground state transitions for uh, realizing such qubits. You can also realize, take a ground state here of an atom and then take a very long-lived excited state where there's really an optical frequency between those two states. For example, an uh, optical clock transition in strontium would be a good example where this upper state is really has extremely long lifetime, so can be considered metastable. And then this could also be a good, good choice for your two spin states that you want to implement in your system, just to give you, give you an example what you can choose. So the system sizes we're going to talk about are up to a few thousand particles. I'm going to show you some pictures of, for that. And uh, mobility, as I said, can be either motion in the system, so it can be itinerant, or we can also fix the particles, lock them into the lattice by just making this lattice very deep. Right? So if this is very deep, then the tunnel coupling will be exponentially suppressed and they're just stuck where they are, and then we just have to realize, you know, maybe other interactions to make something interesting between the, uh, between the atoms in the system. All right, so here's again the, the summary. You basically realize such lattices by just interfering to laser beams giving you these uh, structures. You have your harmonic oscillators on each lattice side. The vibrational splitting is typically in the order of 10 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. And the ground state extension, the size of this Gaussian wave pack in the lowest vibrational state here, is between typically 10 nanometers and 100 nanometers, just to give you a feeling of the um, spatial scales and the energy scales involved in the system. And the tunnel couplings between lattice sites are typically between 100 hertz and, and 5 kilohertz. Okay, just give you, give you a flavor of how long it takes for the particles to tunnel. You can realize all kinds of lattice structures. This is quite nice. I'll show you an example where we recently found a nice way how to, in one experimental setting, to realize all of these different lattices. You could have a square lattice, which is mostly what we're going to talk about today. You can have hexagonal lattice, triangular lattices, Kagome lattices, leap lattices. So basically, this at the tune of a knob, you can switch from long one lattice configuration to the next one. Okay, and that's of course very interesting, because in many cases, this uh, a lot of the physics, of course, depends on the geometry you have. In the square lattice case, you can also make the system easily one-dimensional, go from 2D to 1D by just making, let's say, the lattice in this direction very deep, so you decouple all these one-dimensional systems from each other, so tunnel coupling is, is suppressed in this vertical direction and only allowed in the horizontal direction, and then you have a one-dimensional system. So again, by tuning the power of the laser beams, you can easily, very easily, continuously cross over, study cross over from 1D to 2D, and if you uh, use this trick of changing the geometry, you can also change the geometry of this system. Actually, one way of looking at that uh, um, is to measure something that we call a quantum walk, continuous time quantum walk, just to show that this works. So what you do is you place a single atom in the lattice, on one lattice side, and then you just let it tunnel. Okay, And then you measure the probability of recording the particle at a later time at a different lattice side. And uh, this is just shows you that you know, for these different lattices, you get very different results. And for us, as an experimentalist, it's a good way to check whether the lattice has really good properties, whether we really have coherent tunneling motion in the lattices. And we can see that all these have very, very different expansion behaviors if you put single particles onto them. But this is a nice way, actually, for us, for us to check that in the experiment. All right. Um, yeah, for interactions, what, what kind of interactions do people use? on these lattices. So mostly what we're going to talk about today is this collisional interaction. So when two atoms come together on this single lattice side, so two atoms come together here, they can interact and they do this with a collisional interaction. So they really collide through their molecular potentials. And we can derive an associated energy scale connected to that. And this would be this energy scale U, which just describes this two-body interaction, two-body contact interaction, which tells us, you know, what is the energy shift that we get. This, uh, contact, this uh, interaction energy scale depends on the scattering length between the atoms, so it's a scattering problem that you have to solve. And uh, nicely, this A is actually tunable via a magnetic field uh, using so-called Feshbach resonances. So this is actually very nice, so you can, 
tune this lattice interaction strength via the Feshbach resonances through a tuning of a magnetic field. And you can go actually from cases where the scattering length is negative and you get attractive interactions to cases where the scattering length is positive, you have repulsive interactions, to cases where the scattering length is zero where you have a non-interacting gas. And that's of course good, res good, good cases to compare to each other because we can compare, let's say, the non-interacting case to repulsively interacting case. We can change repulsive interactions. We can dynamically switch interactions in the system to see what happens. So this is mostly what we're going to talk about today, collisional interactions, and the only parameter that is relevant for that is this what we call on-site Hubbard U parameter, which characterizes this two-body interaction. Okay. Uh, it's short-ranged, remember, because the atoms in our case, there's no Coulomb, long-range Coulomb interaction. They're neutral atoms, so they are, it can just interact when they come together. And so we actually ideally realize this, this contact interaction. There's really not much interaction between neighboring sites because the overlap of the wave functions between neighboring sites is really very, very small. Now, there are other type of interactions you can have that people have been using that are actually very interesting as well if you want to interest different things. You can have, uh, for example, if you use magnetic atoms, if you use atoms which have a strong magnetic moment, you could have, of course, also magnetic dipole-dipole interactions. They are, of course, longer ranged. Okay, they are not just confined to a single lattice site, and they act then also on, on, on neighboring lattice sites. Or if you're dealing with polar molecules, for example, uh, where you have a diatomic molecule with a strong electric dipole moment, you can have electric dipole-dipole interactions, and then you could have interaction strengths of s um, up to a few kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, between neighboring lattice sites also. Okay, so this gives you actually some room to also engineer long-range interactions. Uh, a bit exotic in this case is uh, this Rydberg dipole dipole interaction, which gives you an extremely huge interaction, so it uh, provokes completely different kind of physics. I'm not going to talk about this a lot today. Is when you take a, a ground state atom and you excite one of the electrons to a very high principal quantum number, so the electron is very far away from the core. Then you get an extremely polarizable atom, so the electron is just very, very weakly bound to the core. And if you have two of these, then of course there can be, uh, because of their strong polarizabilities, there can be strong dipole-dipole uh, van der Waals type interaction between those two. And they can be really dramatically large because these atoms are, have such large radii and such high polarizabilities that you can get interaction strengths of uh, you know, up to 500 megahertz, 1 gigahertz interaction scales of atoms close to each other. So this, of course, is very nice uh, when you want to do very fast interaction timescales uh, in the system. Another final thing I want to comment on is this idea of using cavities. A lot of people are using cavities to mediate interaction. I just want to give you the idea of that. So uh, basically there you can real realize an all-to-all -all, uh, interaction between the atoms. So every atom, oops, sorry, every atom talks to every other atom in the system. And the idea how this works is that when you put a photon into this cavity mode, it I interacts with this first atom here, then the atom photon is carried on further on to this atom, interacts with this atom here, and is reflected back and forth many, many times, such that you basically have this photon cavity-mediated interaction over all atoms in the system. So then you have this all-to-all -all connectivity of the atoms in the system. All right. So the next tool, what we need, is to observe the particles in the system and to detect them. And for that, what has been extremely useful is this tool of quantum gas microscopy. And the general idea of that is that you have your, let's say, system that you prepared, your ultra-cold quantum gas, in, for example, a two-dimensional layer uh, in, in with a square lattice, for example, in the x and y directions, and the z layer, Z lattice making planes and you only populated one plane, so you have this nice 2D system that you created and you want to observe the atoms. And the way how we observe them is a destructive way, is that we start to scatter light off this many-body state and make the atoms fluoresce. And the fluorescence we just capture uh, with this very good microscope objective, which has a high numerical aperture, so it captures a lot of the scattered photons, very efficient, and then allows us to make a fluorescence image of the position of the particles in the lattice, okay? And then you get something like this. This is a nice picture from a uh, former postdoc of mine, Jeon Choi in, in, in Korea, who has a really beautiful pictures on this where you can suddenly see in larger systems, even though each bright spot here is an individual atom that you see on such a lattice site, okay? So you can clearly see there is an atom or there's no atom in the system, and you can clearly see which of the lattice sites uh, these atoms occupy, okay? <coughs> 
and this is what we call the fluorescence detection. Now this is a destructive technique. Once these atoms light up, they fluoresce. The many-body state is destroyed, and we'll talk about what we're actually measuring then. But if you want to take another picture, you typically, I mean, you can take another picture of the same system, but you, you get the same picture, but it's not the original quantum state that you had in the system, right? So that's a destructive measurement that you're doing here, and if you want to measure the same quantum state, you really have to go through the cycle of preparing the same quantum state again, then taking another picture like this one, and we'll... We'll, we'll talk about what you learn from pictures like this one. Yeah? But this is really, really extremely nice that you can see this with such high uh, you know, contrast. Uh, so you typically scatter a few thousand photons in the system from each atom, and, and you can see them really directly. Question? Question? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. I don't know. In his case, we try to avoid that. There are some inhomogeneities in the laser or the cooling process, which makes the atoms fluoresce. So typically, we, we get histograms. So if we, you know, we just get histogram counts. So, you know, the, the, the number of counts and the probability typically get something like this for a single site, which is like for a zero ad, we try to get a situation where this would be one atom on that lattice side, and this would be zero atoms. So this, this part just comes from background fluorescence. There's always a little bit of background fluorescence. And we try to be in a situation, of course, where this peak, where you have n equal 1, is well separated from the other one. Okay, so we can clearly tell if there's an atom or not, and we can you know, put a discriminator here and say, okay, and we have, okay, there are more advanced algorithms that do this for us, but we, this is the general idea. And we try to get that. Now you see this, the, the width is indeed what the width of this histogram is exactly what you're seeing. In principle, this should just be uh, ideally shot noise. Let's say if you scatter n uh, you know, photons, you have the square root n fluctuations. So there should be some fluctuations. But typically, these fluctuations are larger than shot noise. And the reason is probably mostly that there are some regions which the laser induces more fluorescence or less fluorescence, uh, and this is what we want to avoid. Indeed, we want to make this peak obviously as narrow as possible as we allow, and that's short noise is the ultimate limit for us to do that. And um, yeah, but, but, but if we're in such a situation, we're good. Yeah, if we can really discriminate between zero and one, then we're fine in the system. That's what we want to achieve. Yes? Yes, so basically you no no you emit many photons each atom actually emits thousands of photons for such an image and you capture maybe 100 of them with your objective and the illumination time is typically a few hundred milliseconds to take such a picture. Okay, so it takes a few hundred milliseconds to scatter the photons in principle from the transition we could scatter much faster but we have to simultaneously cool the atoms that they don't hop out of these um out of these wells. So you see the challenge is we want to make the, the atoms fluoresce, so we want to make them emit photons. That's good. We want to make them light up. But these photons recoil, they actually heat up the atom. So if they heat up the atom too much, the atom will jump to the next well, you know, stochastically, just classically over the barrier, and we don't want that. That's of course bad because then the position of the atom that we detect would not correspond to the original position where it was, and we don't want that. So we have to make very sure that in the detection process, you know, we keep the atoms where they are, so we have a combination of laser cooling and this fluorescence going on, which keeps the atom locked to this position, and we have to fine-tune this point. Okay? Very good. Yes? Can, can you resolve the Sorry? The perpendicular to the plane. Uh, that's a good, good question. Uh, typically, that's harder. Um, so we can use tomographic techniques to do that. So that's why we mostly, with these microscopes, like to work with low-dimensional systems, 2D or 1D. Also, bilayer is fine. If you have a 3D system where you have multiple planes in the Z direction, you would have to first... The, the problem is, if you would just take a photo, you would see all the other planes out of focus. You see, the microscope has a resolution laterally on the order of lambda. So, uh, so we try to get the best resolution, or lambda over 2. So also in the z direction, it means it has a resolution depth of focus of also just lambda over 2. And that means that the other planes that would be there would be out of focus. And that would be very bad because they would produce a very blurred background uh, uh, for us and give us a strong background and spoil this discrimination that I talked about. So typically what we have to do to do that, we have to remove the other planes. 
you remove the other planes and then just detect the plane you want to detect. So it's like a tomographic slicing technique. Or you hide the other planes, you don't make them fluoresce. You hide the other planes and mo only make one plane fluoresce and then you make the other plane fluoresce. I'll, I'll tell you tricks how to do that in a second, actually. Yeah, good question. So mostly, mostly going to look at 1D and 2D systems. But these are the interesting ones for correlation physics anyway, a little bit more interesting ones, so that's, that's good. Okay, and then you can run, you know, algorithms to, to take images like this one and reconstruct the position of the atoms on that lattice, and here are just some reconstructions, and just to show you, you know, if we, for example, drive this transition from a weakly interacting Bose-Einstein condensate to a strongly interacting mod insulator uh, that you saw before, this quantum phase transition between those two phases, you clearly see these dramatic differences between the pictures yeah, in the quantum statistics of your occupation of your lattice sites. So here you basically have Glauber states, you have coherent states with half Poissonian uh, particle number distribution, and you see a lot of fluctuations in the occupation, whereas in this mod insulating state, in this atomic limit at least, you basically have zero particle number fluctuations and the atoms to minimize interaction energy just order in to this state where you have exactly one atom per lattice site. Okay? And th there's nothing we do actively, the atoms, we just crank up the interactions. And then the, the atoms, the phase of the system changes from this phase into this phase. Um, we also do a lot of potential engineering I'll talk about. So we can actually, you know, by when you can observe atoms with good resolution, you can just do the other thing. You can just, let's say, send a laser beam through this objective in the reverse direction to shine a potential via light fields onto the atoms. And that's actually interesting because Thierry always wants to get rid of the harmonic trap, and this is how we actually get rid of the harmonic trap. Now we can make confinements which are just pure box potentials. So this would be just the wall of your system. Uh, you could make some exotic lattice structures if you want, or if you're interested in quantum transport, which is what, what Tilman Esslinger has been doing in slightly different geometries, but this is a super nice uh, way of studying quantum transport because you could just make two reservoirs, two boxes of light, you connect them by this wire of light, yeah? and then you fill up this box with atoms, for example. You have no atoms here, and you study how the atoms propagate through this wire from this one box to the next. That would be the voltage difference, the filling, and then you can study disorder, interaction, while Thierry, talk to Thierry about it, all the interesting stuff that you want in this transport. Yeah. Uh, you can also address uh, single atoms, control the initial state. We're going to use that also by again shining laser beam in the reverse direction onto the atoms, onto an individual lattice site, for example, and then you can, for example, flip the spin of this specific atom. So you say you want to go to atom 44, 53 in that two-dimensional coordinate system, and you want to control the spin state, then you just move your laser beam there, and you do a rotation on the block sphere into the uh, direction you want. Now I have to say this doesn't work for us with the high fidelities that you get, for example, in the ion traps simply uh, because the separation of the particles here is much, much closer. We want the separation to be close, remember, because we want the atoms to tunnel. This half micron separation makes it much harder for us to do this with the high fidelities that you get, for example, in ion trap experiments, where the separation between atoms is typically five micron or something. So it's like an order of magnitude larger in Rydberg arrays or ion traps than what we're dealing here, but, but we're using this technique also. All right, so let me show you a few pictures with this potential shaping that you can uh, realize. Um, you can, for example, realize interesting ladder-type structures where you kind of have two one-dimensional systems coupled to each other, and you can also control the edge termination. And this, actually, we found if you put fermions and this antiferromagnetic ladder with the correct edge termination, you actually realize this uh, paradigmatic uh, spin one Haldane phase, the symmetry-protected topological phase, and you can measure the edge states, you can measure the bulk properties of the system uh, by just controlling, for example, the shape of the system, including the edges. So that's actually very nice. You can also go to very, very large systems now, and we, this is really something that's happened in the last year where we've been really expanding system sizes dramatically. Uh, so you see now mod insulators here for this rubidium system or this new cesium system that we're working on with Monica Eidelsberger together. Where we have 3,000 to 5,000 atoms and really high fillings up to 98%. And this is just, you see now this mod insulator, this homogeneous fluorescence, you have one atom per lattice site this really large system in the box, in a homogeneous box, no harmonic potential anymore, and whenever you see a hole, it's actually an atom missing at that site. Okay, so it's actually a defect, a thermal defect probably in the system. And you see this works actually extremely well, uh, going to these larger system sizes using these potential shaping techniques. 
Um, all right, yeah, uh, one final thing I want to tell you is um, actually how for fermions we have a, a more challenging detection problem because for fermions you really, uh, let's say you have this configuration of fermions, uh, you will not only want to know where an atom is, but could you also want to know where is the spin up and the spin down or where is a double on or a hole. You have actually four states that you want to distinguish from each other. A doubly occupied site, spin up and down, an empty site, or a spin up or a spin down state. And uh, one way to do that that we, 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 uh, we realized is to do the following. Actually, to take if you have this is the physical system, we can split the physical system under the action of a magnetic gradient field into two planes. So do basically a controlled stern gerlach separation where the spins up, spin up, spin ups are moved into the upper plane and the spin downs are moved into the lower plane. And then we keep um, separating them using actually topological spin pump, so we separate those layers, so in the end what you uh, end up with two layers, one where all the spin ups are and one all the spin downs are of your original physical system. Okay? And this, but this is just for detection. It's just for detection purposes. This is the physical system and then for detection we split it. And then we can focus, for example, one of the, the cameras, the lens, onto the lower plane and take a fluorescence image of the lower plane. Then we can move the lens to focus onto the upper plane and take an image of the upper plane. And now we get two images, one for the spin ups and one for the spin downs in the system. And then we can put them together. Uh, so here are two examples. So you start with a single monolayer. You do the splitting and the charge pumping to separate these two layers. And now they're actually separated over a large distance. And you can take two photos. And because they are now coming back the question of the 3D system. Now you see they are very far apart. We try to pump these layers to very large distances. So if I focus on this layer, this one's going to be really out of focus and the background is not going to be visible. Okay? If they would be very close still, like here, the background would still be pretty bad of the other layer. So we really use this separation, spatial separation, uh, to have a good discrimination in the, in the detection process. These are the two images and you can reconstruct where the atoms were. You put that together and you get your occupation of the system. Okay, so now you know where the spin ups are, the spin downs are, where the holes are, where the doublons are in the system. So this is like if you want uh, for the detection process, it's like thinking about you have initially your many body state. I mean of course you have a density matrix but for sake of purpose, let's just say you have your, 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 your many-body state and there are of course complex coefficients also here. But in general it will be a superposition of different configurations, spatial configurations of your particles, your electrons. And now basically what you're doing when you make a measurement like the one I showed you here, you're making a projective measurement in the particle number basis onto one of those configurations. So you're, you, you don't know which, wave, which configuration th this many-body state is going to collapse on, but on one of those it's going to collapse on with the probability given by, of course, norm C squared, the coefficient here in front of this configuration, and uh, that's what you're going to see. And that's the pictures I show you. Yeah? But it's completely random which one you're going to see in an individual shot. So also it also tells you that individual shots don't carry much meaning. You have to really repeat the experiment, recreate psi, measure again. And in the end, what you get is a probability of configuration. So I can tell you with what probability do I see this configuration, with what probability do I see that configuration, with what probability do I see that configuration. And from these probabilities of individual configurations, I can reconstruct correlation functions and then compare to theory, okay? And then the nice thing, of course, when you have this access to this microscopic snapshots is you really, actually, you think about it, you're really seeing the entire system in one shot. You're seeing what all the electrons, in parentheses, in your system are doing at the same time, okay, what the configuration is. So you can measure not only two-point correlation functions, you can measure higher-order correlation functions in the system because you have this global view onto the system. And this you never have in a real solid. Well, this is, this is one state. I prepare one state, let's say the ground state of my system, and then the ground state will be a superposition of those configurations. So experimentally, well, that would be the chemical potential would be associated with this psi here, right? And that would be a certain psi that I create at a certain chemical potential of the system. And then I measure. But if you make another shot, then ah, if I measure, so if I once measured and I get, let's say I see this picture, 
Let's say you see this picture. Then, of course, you're not in Psi anymore. Then you cannot use that. that you cannot reuse that or continue. It's a destructive measurement. It has to be. It doesn't. Or you see the same picture. You would see the same picture, but then, of course, it's not the original Psi anymore. So not the original. It has nothing to do with any, you know, the ground states or what of your original system anymore. So you really have to. That's why I'm saying it's very important. You have to really, after you measure it, you have to go and recreate Psi. And then measure again. So that's why we have to go through all this cycle of. Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You have to recreate the same psi. Yeah. And of course, that's our challenge to really recreate the same psi. Uh, of course, it's a density matrix in in reality, of course. But yes, that's that's how this works. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Yes, this depends, of course, what you want to reconstruct. If you want to reconstruct, let's say, a full a correlation function, which is as large as the system size, that would require a lot of statistics on your system, a lot of statistics that you have to take. So what we have been doing is going up to eight-point correlation functions, and that requires, of course, more and more statistics to measure those to a certain precision. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, so t well, okay. We typically, depending on uh, so some of the experiments you see, typically comprise of several thousand shots, ten thousand shots, maybe, that we take of individual snapshots to say something about the correlation function. This would be like four-point correlation functions, for example, where we measure a few thousand shots to get that. But that's a good question. What's this? That's what people call the sampling complexity. You know, how many shots do you need to get to measure certain observables to a certain precision? Yeah. yeah, so one shot in these systems is about uh, 10 to 20 seconds, depending on the experiment. So we're working on next uh, generation of experiments, actually also Naman's experiment, that's why you should talk to Naman about it. We're, we're trying to build these systems, you know, where we can get to sub-second cycle times. Okay, so you would have sub-second and uh, typically how this works is, the, you know, we program the system over the night, it runs automatically overnight and you take the data overnight and you come in the morning and read if the laser hasn't crashed, you, you're fine, you're happy, you take your data and, and, and evaluate it. Mm. Very good. More questions? Yeah, you're asking the right questions, very good. Um, Okay, so let's continue and let's actually apply this now to a few problems. So we know what we can detect, we know what we can uh, do, and uh, so let's let's apply this to the Fermi-Hubbard model. Uh, as I said, it's this very simple model of just having hopping between neighboring lattice site and this on-site interactions of uh, two electrons, in this case our two atoms with two spin states up and down, and we really almost perfectly realize this model in the system. You know at half filling uh, and strong interactions, we can map this model onto a spin model, you get an antiferromagnetic Heisenberg model. And so you know actually for the undoped case, if we look at the phase diagram of the cuprates uh, and the undoped case, indeed you see this nice antiferromagnetic region here. And then when you start to introduce holes, uh, mobile dopants into the system, you see how all these kind of uh, interesting phases of matter appear. And this is, of course, what everything is about to understand this phase diagram, to understand what's going on. But essentially, if you ask, from a simple point of view, what you're trying to ask is the competition between mobile impurities, for example, holes, and an antiferromagnetic background. That's what you're really trying to understand here. The single one or multiples, what are they doing uh, uh, when you have magnetic order in the system? And we see this is, sounds like a simple problem, but it actually is very, very intriguing and very complex problem. All right, so let me show you a few examples on this. So let's start, first of all, ensuring that we can really uh, get to this uh, antiferromagnetic regime for zero doping. Here's uh, very nice results from Markus Greiner's group from 2017, where basically realized these mod insulators uh, for these fermionic atoms. If you look at the density, you get unit density in the region. And if you uh, remove one spin component, he didn't have this fancy detection I showed you before, so he had to use a a different way of revealing the spin ups on the spin downs and what he did was to just you know get rid of the spin downs uh, and then you have only the spin ups left you see sometimes pictures like this i guess this is one of the better snapshots this is this is a picture you know misleading in a heisenberg magnet you very rarely 
see pictures like this for single snapshots because in the z-plane and the z-measurement basis you would very rarely see this nail configuration but if you do of course the correlation function and do this with many many of those snapshots you can indeed see that you get um, antiferromagnetic correlations across the entire system size so you really ensure that the antiferromagnetic correlations extend across the entire system all right and then we can start out as uh, Thierry uh, has been at, uh, well, this lecture didn't tell you so much about it, but uh, if you want to go and read more about it, then I advise you to look at Thierry's book on this, on, 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 on the Wandy system, which I just very briefly want to discuss. Uh, and just actually then quickly jump to the 2D system because it's actually much more uh, complex there or a very different situation there. Um, so let's start. Let's imagine we have a 1D chain and we have this Heisenberg uh, chain and we have just antiferromagnetic order in this Heisenberg chain. And then we put mobile dopants into the system. And if we put a single dopant into the system, actually it turns out that the ground state exhibits uh, what we call ground spin charge separation, actually a very beautiful mathematical formulation from Wojnarowicz and Ugata and Shiba, which showed this precisely using, uh, I think in the case of Wojnarowicz, beta ansatz solutions, that you can factor the wave function, the many body ground state wave function into a part which contains the magnetic order living on the position of the electrons and then a part which just describes the density of the electrons. So it's really a factorization of your many body wave function in the ground state for u going to infinity and it's known to be the exact result for this case. And that actually means, for example, if you put a single uh, impurity here, a single hole, that there will be a flip in the parity of the domain wall from, let's say, this is order down, up, down, out, down, up, down, up, and if we call the other order up, down, up, down, minus one, then you actually see what a single hole does. It flips the parity of the antiferromagnetic order across this hole. So this hole, in a way, acts like a domain wall for the antiferromagnetic order. It's a topological excitation because it not only affects locally the system in one dimension, but it affects the entire system. You know, even 100 sites away in the ground state, you will feel that there was this hole here because the parity of the uh, magnetism is flipped. Okay. So it really has a global effect on it. And we measured that. So if we look at it, so we uh, look actually at the spin correlations. If there is a hole in between the two spins or if there's no hole between the two spins, and we plot the parity of this, uh, um, this blocks of spin, and you can indeed see, without going into too much detail, the sign here, flip sign when you have a hole in between or when you don't have a hole in between the two spins you're correlating, really showing this nice uh, spin charge separation in the ground state of the system. There's uh, another way to look at this from Luttinger liquid theory is to see that actually if you dope the system with holes, you get incommensurate magnetism, so you don't get antiferromagnetic order with pi wave vector, but you get something from Luttinger liquid theory where this gives you stretched antiferromagnetic order, and one way to think about it is that if you put additionally holes into the system, they lead to kind of stretching out of the um, uh, antiferromagnetically aligned spins, or if you put excess uh, spin ups or downs, if you magnetize the system, if you polarize it, you can think of the system as putting excess number of, of spinons here uh, into the system, which also lead to this uh, stretched magnetization that, that, that was also measured in the experiment. Um, one final thing, just for coming to more dynamical aspects, was interesting that you can also, you know, if you start with such a spin chain, you can actually kick out and you don't and you prepare the ground state you can dynamically kick out a particle from the system so imagine we have this spin chain this antiferromagnetic chain which i just for illustration purposes draw as this nail state and then we go in with a laser beam and we just remove this spin okay if we just create a hole and then you ask what happens as the system evolves uh, uh, after you remove this this spin in the system, and it turns out what actually what you get is you get two quasi-particles, you get a deconfinement of this uh, hole that you introduced, and you basically you create one spinon which propagates in one direction, which is one quasi-particle with the spin one-half quantum number, and you get the hole uh, which carries the charge quantum number of the system, and they, in one dimension, they can separate over arbitrary distances from each other, and this is what is known as spin-charge separation, okay? Uh, in, in, the, in dynamical spin charge separation. And I think what's nice that here you can really see this in real space, you can see this fractionalization of the electron that you're moving, of the particle that you're moving, into these two excitation degrees of freedom and track that dynamically and really measure that directly through these correlation functions. All right, I actually want to switch to 2D 
Are we doing on time? It's good. I uh, actually want to switch to 2D now and uh, talk about what happens in two dimensions. And actually, the same, uh, you can ask us exactly the same question. What does a single uh, impurity do in an antiferromagnetic background? That's what you want to know. And this question was actually asked early on, and uh, I found just this, many people asked this question, but I you know, was intrigued to find this one, 1989, from Charlie Kane, Patrick Lee, and Nick Reed, you know, just three, three heroes in condensed matter theory working on this problem together that try to think of this exactly as a Gedanken experiment, what, what happens under such a situation. But for us, it doesn't have to be a Gedanken experiment. We can really realize this uh, situation where you have a single impurity and you look how that behaves in the system, how the correlations are distorted, how that moves in the system. So one way to think about it, why this is such a different situation than 1D, where we had spin charge deconfinement, is to think about uh, impurity that you introduce into an antiferromagnet in 2D, and now for technical reasons we rather prefer to work with doublons rather than holes, but it doesn't really matter for the problem. So imagine uh, you can also think of a hole here, but uh, let me explain the story with a doublon. This is what we used. And now if you, this, let's say, the spin-up particle moves to this side, then the doublon has effectively moved. But if you look at the string, at the spins that it leaves behind, in contrast to the 1D case, it leaves behind a damaged string of spins with the wrong orientation. Remember, you have antiferromagnetic spin couplings, and if this spin moves, this is not the optimal spin configuration here. And now if this, this spin down moves here, then the doublon has moved even one side more, and, and you see actually you leave more damaged strings behind, spins behind. So the more you move in 2D, the more damage you leave behind. And this is very different from 1D. In 1D, the m you can move without paying any damage penalty. And that's why in, in 1D, you basically have this deconfinement. You can move as far as you want, but in 2D, you cannot. And you can immediately see, of course, well, you know, what's going to happen? This, here, you're going to have an increased magnetic energy cost because of this ferromagnetic alignment. You're going to reduce kinetic energy of the doublon because it can spread out, so it likes to spread out, it favors kinetic energy, but um, it would have to pay a lot of um, magnetic energy, so there has to be a balance of both when finding the ground state of the two. And what actually happens um, is that in this case, you have confinement between the spin-on and the hole-on uh, to actually form a new quasi-particle, which is, of course, the, the magnetic polaron that forms around this impurity. So you basically get a region of distorted spin correlations around this impurity where you basically have reduced antiferromagnetic correlations or in the case of you know, Nagaoka ferromagnetism, you could even turn this single impurity, could turn the entire system ferromagnetic, but that would lead to require extremely low temperatures. But the idea is you get reduced antiferromagnetic correlations here or maybe even slightly ferromagnetic correlations. So the hole can move easily within that range it doesn't pay the magnetic energy cost, but only over that finite range. If you want to do it over larger distances, you can't do that because that would cost you too much, too much magnetic energy. Is it Goldstone mode? Can you look at this? I don't think it's a Goldstone mode. It's just a polaron. It's just a quasi-particle that the new quasi-particle polaron quasi-particle that appears. So I don't think it has anything to do. Uh, related question. Yes. Too much no, no. You should interrupt. That's uh, the idea. <laughs> Yeah. You can think in this direction, but first of all, let me say, indeed, of course, the picture I'm drawing here is this classical Niel state picture, but it's not the Eigen state of the Hamiltonian. It's indeed the Heisenberg. It's just my, it's the best way we can, yeah, it's the best way for us to draw a Heisenberg antiferromagnet, but it's something more, much more complex than this classical non-entangled Niel state. It's really something with a lot of correlations and entanglement. Yeah, sure, you can measure. I mean, you can measure in different directions. So indeed, when you measure in one direction, you not always you don't always get the direction right in which the order if this if you think about it in terms of spontaneous symmetry breaking, in each measurement where you measure, you don't get the direction right because it's spontaneously broken when you measure that. So that's why of course the correlations that you measure are not perfect correlations, but they are reduced correlations. If you remember, let me go back to this picture from Marcus here. If you look at the correlation signal here, it's not one which it would be, you know, for a perfect Niel state, because then everything is just up, down, up, down, up, down. You should measure perfect correlations in the system, but it's much lower. And because it's, it's much lower because of these quantum fluctuations in the system. And that's indeed the right way to think about this. Yes. So it's exactly, but yes, so whenever I draw up, down, up, downs, it's never up, down, up, downs. It's just my, you know, best way of thinking in a cartoon picture of the Heisenberg, of the Heisenberg uh, magnet.
indeed. Um, yes. Very good. Um, yeah, okay. So now, actually, I just want to show you pictures that we can really measure this Polaron. We can directly take pictures of it. And this is already shows you the power of this technique because you, can, you need a three-point correlation function to measure this Polaron microscopically to take a photo. And you cannot do that in any condensed matter, standard condensed matter experiment. So what am I showing you here? So these are the spin-spin correlations between neighboring spins. So this would be one spin, another spin uh, in the horizontal direction, vertical direction. And I'm encoding the spin-spin correlation as this uh, ellipse here. And the color of the ellipse tells me how strong the spin-spin, the Z Z correlation is between those two spins. OK? Now, uh, we want to center this. We want to know how are the spin correlations distorted around impurity, around the mobile impurity. So actually, it's a three-point correlator. What do we want to know? We want to know. Given that I have a impurity at this position, what are the spin-spin correlations of those two sides? So it's actually correlating spin 1 with spin 2, conditioned on having a hole here. It's a three-point correlator. Right? And how do we measure that? Well, in a picture, remember, when we take these snapshots, we will see the impurity imp appearing completely random anywhere in the system. We don't know where the impurity is. It's delocalized over the entire system. It can appear anywhere in the system. We just measure it. In one shot, we find it there. Okay? And then, we just know, look, what are the SZ -SZ correlations around that spin? And we repeat the experiment. We create Psi, measure it again. We find impurity somewhere completely different, measure the SZ -SZ correlations around it. And then we recenter everything onto this, that we take the position where we found that impurity as the origin of our coordinate system here. Okay? And then you can nicely see how you can see this spin back, this spin distortions around the mobile impurity appearing. So you can really nicely see how if you're in the vicinity of this impurity, you get this uh, um, spin distortions around the magnetic impurity. And if you look at it on these diagonals, you can even see that the diagonal correlators are completely flipped compared to what you see in the background of the system. Okay? So this is the first microscopic picture of this Polaron where you can really directly see the spin distortions of this impurity. And when this impurity moves, for example, it not only has to move as an impurity, it has to always drag the spin distortions with it. That's what makes the Polaron, basically. Right? It has to drag this cloud of distorted spins together with it around this impurity. Uh, there was also a nice experiment by Markus Group uh, in 2021 where he looked at how fast does this Polaron actually form, what the time scale of this is related to what we had been doing in 1D. So it shoots out this uh, particle here in the center of the 2D system and just asks, you know, how fast does the cloud surrounding the Polaron form, this impurity form that makes the Polaron, and then how does this spread out? And he find, uh, finds two time scales where you have a very quick time scale of formation of the spin distortion around the impurity and then the whole polaron starts to you know move out in space and, um, and and delocalize in entire space so you can also dynamically see how this thing is born and evolves then in in the system all right uh, one final thing actually um, uh, peter is going to tell about it more on his poster so i just will just very quickly tell about it it just gives you also new ideas of how to um, create new binding mechanisms for uh, for uh, for particles for holes in the system. Eventually, of course, that's where we want to go to to look for high TC effects. So we want to look at binding of holes. And uh, if you ask yourself, what's actually interesting is actually to think about how can you actually bind in a system that has only repulsive interactions. So we're dealing with the Hubbard model. Everything is repulsively interacting. So how come you can get binding? Wouldn't you need attractive interactions to bind something? It turns out that's not needed. In, in fact, magnetic correlations alone can lead to binding of, of, of particles uh, in the system. Let me give you the idea of that. Let's imagine you have this ladder system. And you have a ladder where you have um, antiferromagnetic couplings along the rung and along the leg of the ladder. But let's say you have very strong rung couplings. So you, uh, you can picture this as uh, singlets forming along uh, the rungs of the system. And you have two holes in the system. Now imagine the first hole moves to the right. And if the first hole moves to the right, then actually you see, again, it's going to have to pay magnetic energy costs because you're breaking the spin singlets along the rungs. They're not along the rungs anymore, they're along the diagonal, and that's not good. That's going to cost you energy. So you can remove this energy penalty by actually bringing this original hole back to the same position as the first hole is moved, and then you undid the damage again, and you basically uh, can have a lower energy state with the um, pairs now aligned to each other. So from this magnetic correlation effect, you can see alone you can get pair binding. 
Okay. However, I sweep one thing under the rug, which is why on the ladder, on the standard ladder, this is extremely weak effect. Why is this extremely weak effect? Because we're missing one, we missed one point. One other point we have to take into account is not only magnetic correlation, remember it's also about the kinetic energy cost of the pair. If the pair cannot delocalize along the rung, then there's basically an energy penalty. It cannot gain this kinetic energy when it delocalizes along the rung. Here it can do that, but if there's another hole already there, it can't delocalize onto the other side, so it cannot gain the kinetic energy along the rung anymore. So actually this leads to a whole-hole repulsion. This leads to magnetic binding. There's a whole-hole repulsion. If you balance things out, it turns out, and you can do the numerical calculation, net, you get a binding of these holes, but the binding energy is extremely weak. And it's extremely weak because you have this whole hole repulsion, which basically mitigates this magnetic correlation binding effect. Okay? Oh, there's no end. This is all in the ground state, basically. This would be all in the ground state. Yeah. Yes, yes, sure. You have to do the, uh, if you do, if to, to take that, if finite temperature, you have to take that into account. And now, actually, I want to show you a trick uh, that uh, we, we came up with together with Fabian Kust and Annabel Bott on how you can remove that. And actually, this, we, we saw that actually the detrimental thing in 2D, uh, if we call this 2D situation, is that the holes want to delocalize here, but they then have to, you know, they can't do that if there's another hole there. But what if we could go to a mixed dimensional situation where we have a situation where you have spin exchange in the vertical along the rungs and the horizontal, but particles can only tunnel, impurities can only tunnel in one dimension. So particles can only move in 1D, but there is spin exchange in two dimensions, in the vertical and horizontal direction. Then, actually, you remove this energy penalty of the particle, you know, delocalizing, uh, having this whole whole repulsion, that can't happen anymore, and you just have the magnetic binding energy. And that's going to be now a huge energy, and you get a boost of that, and you should see those pairs. And the way one can do that, actually, very simply in these ladder systems, is by going to a configuration where, for example, the right rung has slightly larger energy or chemical potential than the left rung, so you lift that ladder a little bit up, compared uh, that wire compared to the, the right wire is a little bit higher in energy than the left wire here. That prohibits tunneling, so tunneling will be off-resonant. So if this delta is larger than T, then you can't hop anymore because tunneling is off-resonant, but super-exchange is not affected by this delta. So the super-exchange coupling is as large, almost as large as before, basically, if you tilt like that. So if you're in a configuration where you tilt smaller than U but larger than delta, then you are in a configuration where you can realize this. And then you can indeed see that. You can measure this whole-hole uh, correlator. You can see how these things bind together. You get whole correlations, these holes appearing very often on the same rung, and you measure the correlation function, you see that they're now bound. In the untilted ladder, you see that they actually uh, don't want to sit on the same rung. They're anti-correlated around the rung, really directly showing you this strong pairing effect that you get. And you can talk to Peter about all the details of this. I don't want to go into this in detail. I just want to maybe say what's exciting, that really this boosted the binding energy of the pair by a factor of 15 compared to the normal ladder. That's a really huge effect. Yeah, so really a huge uh, increased binding energy. And now, of course, it's interesting, for example, if you would do this in uh, 2D bilayer systems where you could think about the same idea. You have this layer on a higher chemical potential than this layer. You're going to get the same effect, so you're going to get holes that are bound across these, uh, uh, across these layers, and they can have very high mobilities, tightly bound holes, and the question is, of course, what kind of superconducting phases can you have, and can you push uh, TC of superconductivity very, very much by having these tightly bound pairs? Uh, that's something, of course, one, one would like to look at in the experiment. All right, very good. So a final part. Ah, yeah, I should mention the people. Peter is here, actually, so you uh, can talk to him about it on his poster. He can tell you all the details about this. Uh, and uh, Jaya did the spin charge separation. Jan is uh, the polar on work. All right. Um, yeah, final talk. I want to talk about non-equilibrium dynamics. I think we're, we're doing good in time, no? All right. Uh, it's a completely different topic, so but showing you again you know, the, the interesting physics you can study. And uh, for me, this was really wonderful to learn this. Uh, it's about new type of transport phenomena in, in, in this quantum spin chains that was kind of missed before. And it actually connects beautifully to this um, work, statistical physics work of the Kada parisi zhang equation. You know, most of you probably know that this was introduced uh, by Mehmet Kada, Giorgio Parisi, and Yiping Zhang in 1986 in the context of you know, 
how do height fields or surfaces grow? Statistical physics effects, you will come to that. You just drop particles on a surface and you ask how does the surface grow with time? And what you find is that you get this nonlinear stochastic partial differential equation for this height field. So this is the height field variable uh, at position x at time t. This describes its growth rate. There's this uh, Laplacian term here, which is just simple smoothening of the, p uh, of the height field. So if you drop a particle, it spreads out a little bit. So there's some smoothening term. Uh, then there's the st stochastic part, which is just this random dropping of particles onto the system. And then there's this nonlinear part, which makes this so, so difficult, this equation, which we'll come to in, the second, in a second. And uh, it actually is really abundant in uh, statistical physics. Uh, I'll show you a few examples. But it's also beautiful in mathematical physics and Martin Heirer she was awarded the Fields Medal for important solutions to this uh, stochastic partial differential equation in 2014. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, great. Very good. Thanks, Thierry. I didn't know. I didn't know that. Okay, so just to show you, this this really appears everywhere. And when we talk about uh, the shape of these surfaces, we talk about Carter parisi zhang universality. It's uh, how these, sh these correlation functions of these surfaces look like. And they appear basically everywhere. If you look in bacterial tumor growth, traffic flow, or this fluff fires. I don't know if you've ever seen this fluff fire. Apparently kids like this a lot. Uh, if you look on YouTube, there are tons of videos on this. So this is from the dandelion, the white, the fluff, right? And it burns like crazy, <laughs> actually, but leaves the grass fortunately unharmed. And the shape of this fire front uh, has this universality properties. Also coffee stains uh, when you lift up your cup of coffee, uh, snowflakes. So really, it, it's everywhere in statistical physics. This is why it had such a huge impact, actually, in describing this. Uh, and that's how this, I'll talk about this, how this shapes are, this is what we understand as KPZ universality. There's the equation and then there's universality and we have to distinguish between the two. So uh, if you want to understand what's the difference, it's actually easy to look at this game of Tetris, basically where you drop blocks from uh, above onto the surface and if the columns are basically completely independent from each other and you just have you know, independent columns and you're dropping in this random process, then your surface would look something like this uh, with just normal Gaussian fluctuations in the columns. But if you have this nonlinear term, actually, and you do this dropping process, you already immediately see that the surface acquires a completely different property. What is this nonlinear part? The nonlinear part would mean that you, when this particle drops here and it falls by an adjacent particle, it sticks to that particle. OK, so that's what this nonlinear part models, the sticking when you drop past another particle in the adjacent column. And you can immediately see in this, in this classical simulation that the, the, field, the height field that you get looks completely different than in the uncorrelated columns. Yeah. So it was really a big, big, big thing to, to find that. So now we can uh, look at this height field and we can characterize this more mathematically. We can say, OK, there will be some average growth rate at which this grows in time. There will be fluctuations within each column, which actually turn out to scale like t to the one third, uh, and not t to the one fourth. And there, for Gaussian process, and there will be a, a stochastic, you know, distribution function here from which we draw a distribution function from random variable from which we just draw a number, which describes these fluctuations in the vertical direction. And this is not a Gaussian in this case, but uh, depending on your initial conditions, this is a tracy widom distribution function. And this uh, one characteristic of this tracy widom distribution function is that it actually is, uh, has a finite skewness. It's not symmetric. Uh, it's not a symmetric process. And we'll, we can come back to this. So uh, if you look, for example, this will come back to the fluctuations of this height field will then have this characteristic scaling as t to the one-third and having this tracy widom distribution here. There are also uh, correlations across uh, the height field, uh, spatial correlations, and they are linked in space and time by that dynamical exponent. And the dynamical exponent in this case is 3 halves, so 1.5. And this contrasts to the case of diffusion where you have 2 and ballistic where you have 1. Okay, so it's a different type of uh, how, uh, how uh, transport, how space and time are linked to each other. All right, so everything I told you so far is, is, is classical, but we're in a quantum, want to see some quantum physics here. And this was a big surprise, actually, that you know, nobody had found evidence for this KPZ kind of transport before in, in, a, in a quantum system. I mean, open systems, yes, but those are, again, more like classical systems, but not enclosed. 
closed quantum systems until there was this very beautiful work from Tomasz Prosen's group in Ljubljana in 2017, 2019, showing you that indeed there's numerical evidence for that. And why people didn't discover that in the Heisenberg chain, you think, you know, Heisenberg chain must have been studied to death. We must know everything about the Heisenberg chain. How can it be this has been missed for such a long time? It turns out the reason why this has been missed is because this is really an infinite temperature phenomena. So it's really about transport at infinite temperature and not at low temperature, which of course what people have been focusing on, which you can read about in Thierry's book on Tomonaga Lutinger liquid theory, this is all about the low T regime. But what I'm going to talk about now is the high T regime, infinite temperature regime, that quantum uh, transport appears there. And there's actually a very nice work by Joel Moore uh, in 2021 where he sh nicely shows how you cross over from this TLL behavior to this uh, infinite temperature behavior. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, for to this infinite temperature behavior that I want to talk about. So the question is what we want to ask is the following. Imagine you have an infinite temperature Heisenberg chain, so completely disordered. You place a spin up in the center of the chain and you ask how does this spin propagate along this chain as a function of time. Okay? And um, what you would have maybe guessed is you know that okay if I measure the dynamical spin-spin correlation function so I look uh, having the spin on at position zero at time zero being spin up, how is that correlated to having uh, this spin, uh, to, uh, finding this spin at a position x at some later time t? And I guess your initial guess, if you would know nothing about the problem, you would say probably diffusion, probably some Gaussian uh, process uh, and a Gaussian function, which is the scaling function. It turns out that's wrong. Yeah? And this is what Tomas found in this numerical work that actually turned out that he found that this dynamical spin-spin correlation function is exactly the KPZ scaling function. So this is something coming from KPZ physics. And space and time are linked together by a dynamical exponent of 3 half. Okay. And here's the numerical evidence for that uh, that you see. If you look at this uh, function, you can really see it beautifully follows this KPZ solution and the Gaussian is, is, is off actually. And this is continuous time and, and discrete model. They can go to even longer times corroborating this, this idea basically. So one way how you can actually measure this and how they also did that in the numerics is not to directly measure the spin-spin correlation function, but to realize that uh, the spin-spin correlation function you can also obtain by looking at the dynamics of domain wall profiles. So in the limit of this domain wall profile visibility going to zero. So what do I mean by domain wall profile? So let's imagine to the left of this side here, this, this kink, you have a little bit more spin-ups and here you have a little bit more spin-downs. And the visibility is just how much many more spin ups and spin downs you have to the left and to the right uh, of the system. And in the limit of eta going to zero, this visibility going to zero, you can show that the dynamical spin spin correlation function is nothing than the derivative of the magnetization profile of the domain wall. Okay? So if you can measure this over, over time, you've basically measured the dynamical spin spin correlation function. All right, now comes the, the, the what, now comes the, uh, uh, part where conjecture uh, in the system. So uh, people know now from quantum numerics that the dynamical spin-spin correlation function is the KPZ scaling function. We also know that from solutions of the KPZ equation, so nothing to do with quantum, just from classical uh, physics, we know that the correlations of the height field of this um, coming from the KPZ equation, they actually obey the following form that uh, the correlation of the derivative of the height field at xt and 0, 0, that's also the KPZ scaling function, okay? So, so this just correlates the height field at position xt with the height field at 0, 0 and just you know, subtracts the average growth rate. So this, are the, this is a correlation function. And so the second derivative of this correlation function is also the KPZ scaling function. And the second derivative of this is this. So then people conjectured, well, if this is the KPZ scaling function and this is the KPZ scaling function, well, then maybe these two things are the same. Maybe then that hydrodynamic or the transport of uh, magnetism in our quantum model, this operator, quantum operator, can be replaced by this derivative of the stochastic variable, which is the height field operator, and these two things are the same. So the conjecture is that the quantum operator is basically the derivative of the height field, and the transport is governed by a KPZ equation. Okay? But that's a conjecture, that nobody, there's no proof for that. It's just a conjecture. You just know two things are equal, and you try to uh, find the underlying equations. But that prediction actually has consequences that we can test in the experiment. So 
for example, if you integrate the uh, the spatial magnet uh, the magnetization profile over space, uh, you get the polarization transfer, and the polarization transfer just means you know how many spins have been transferred from left to right of this uh, domain wall. It's of course a quantum operator because it fluctuates. It will have you know we have an average number of spins that are transferred, but in each shot there will be different number of spins that have been transferred. But if that's correct, this this correspondence, then if we integrate the left hand side and if we integrate the right hand side, this should just be the height field at zero t. Okay. All right, and also we should then see that the average polarization transfer should scale like t to the 1 over z, with z being this 3 half dynamical expansion, and the fluctuations of the polarization transfer, which is something we can measure in the experiment, should correspond to the fluctuations of the height field. And remember, the fluctuations of the height field in KPZ physics, they scale like t to the 1 thirds and this Tracy Widom distribution. Okay? All right. So um, I should say there have been actually very beautiful first experiments on this dynamical exponent in, um, in neutron scattering experiments by Alan Tennant's group, where he for the first time saw that this z is something probably not close to ballistic or diffusive. He found some value inter intermediate closer to this 1.5 value that you expect for KPZ physics, showing that there's actually also in real materials some strong evidence for this, uh, for this behavior. So we can test this now. We can realize the Heisenberg model, and we're going to realize it at the isotropic point here, so uh, delta equal 1. And we can test how the system behaves, what the transport properties are for delta equal 1, and then we can break some symmetries in the system. We can go from an integrable model to a non-integrable model by going from 1D to 2D, or we can break SU2 symmetry by magnetizing the system and you know, showing, seeing how the transport behaves in those cases. So the system we do to do that is our, you know, atoms in the lattice. In this case, rubidium. We take 50. It's a 50 spin in in a 1D system. So it's 1D chains of 50 spins. So it's quite reasonably large system. Uh, also, I would say for numerics to handle that. And then we can have 20 rows of that if we go to the 2D system. So we have a thousand spin system that we can look at. Okay, 1D and 2D again crossover from 1D to 2D also. Yeah, let me skip how we prepare that. That's a little bit details. Um, and then we can prepare the domain wall, and we can prepare first a clean domain wall. So you have these many 1D chains, and to the left, the everything is spin up. To the right, everything is spin down at time t equals 0. And then you let the system evolve for, let's say, 36 exchange times. And you see how these particles from the right, the spin downs, have propagated into the region of the spin ups, and vice versa. Okay, you, Density is always 1. It's just the spins that move into the different regions. So now I just have to count. You know, I just had my original domain wall here, and now I just have to count how many spins have been transferred from left to right in a single shot. And then I repeat the experiment. I get another number. I repeat the experiment. I get another number. And this gives me the full distribution function of the transferred spins from which I can calculate the average number of spins, the fluctuations, the standard deviation, and the skewness, which are the three things we want to know. Um, so if I look at the average transfer of spins, this is the magnetization profile, the domain wall, how it evolves over time, and this is the time evolution, and we fit function to that, we see we really nicely get this 1.54, this 3 halves. And if we compare on this log-log plot to ballistic, which is blue, and uh, diffusive, which is the red, you can clearly see it's neither diffusive nor ballistic. It's clearly, clearly something else in the transport. And if we rescale all the um, magnetization profiles uh, with, the, uh, with this uh, three-half scaling co coefficient, you see they all nicely collapse onto each other. Okay, so really nicely showing that this, the dynamical exponent is indeed three-halves. Now, when we go from 1D to 2D, when we couple all those chains, you actually see that you go away from 1.5 and you go back to diffusion. So apparently, when you break integrability, you are back to the diffusive problem again. So you get diffusion again. When we break, uh, when we magnetize the system and we introduce, let's say, excess magnetization, look at those magnetization profiles, we actually find ballistic expansion. And if I summarize all those three measurements in this table for you, we see that for the 1D case with uh, unmagnetized, we get three halves. 1D case magnetized, we get ballistic transport. Uh, 2D case uh, unmagnetized, we get diffusive transport. So it really seems to rely very much on this uh, SU2 symmetry and um, basically having this integrable model in the system.
So finally, I think this may be the most important new check we could also do to the system that hadn't been done by, by Tomas is to think about the fluctuations, not about the average transfer alone, but also the fluctuations. And the fluctuations of the height field should scale like t to the one-thirds in this Tracy Widom. But remember, this in the conjecture is just the fluctuations of the polarization. So we can measure that. We can measure the standard deviation of that. And that should be, the exponent should be one-third. And indeed, for the 1D situation, which is this green data points, we find a beta of 0.31. And uh, if we look at the skewness of the distribution function that we measure, we find indeed that it's a finite value for the skewness and pretty close to what you expect for this tracy Widom distribution function. So indeed, very strong uh, corroboration that indeed this KPZ universality is indeed realized in these systems. Now, there are actually a lot of questions which I would like to finish off with that people, <laughs> uh, quite embarrassingly, we somehow know there's experimental and numerical strong evidence for this KPZ transport in this Heisenberg chain at infinite temperatures, but nobody has been able to write down the actual equation of transport yet. So we know it's universality class, but nobody knows actually the actual KPZ equation that gives you this magnetization transport for some initial conditions you could put into. That's a little bit embarrassing, <laughs> but, but that's how it is. I mean, nobody has found that yet. Do yeah. you use the lambda from the KPZ equation? No, not even though. Uh, there could be. The, that's just the KPZ equation is one form of that gives rise to KPZ universality, but there could be different variations of that that also give rise to KPZ universality. That's why I want to distinguish between the KPZ standard KPZ equation and the universality class. And what we want to know now, what equation is it of KPZ type that gives you, that can explain this? And nobody's been able to write that down yet. Uh, so, big open problem I I in the system, I would say. I'm um, just showing this, this, thinking about this full counting statistics that is accessible in quantum simulations is really great because you can really, you know, not only apply this to the Heisenberg model, you can apply it to the old XXZ model, and there was really nice work by. Uh, Sarang uh, and Morningstar, Roman Vasseur and, and Vedika Kemani on this using generalized hydrodynamics to predict these uh, full counting statistics, full distribution functions. And this is really something you can measure in the experiment and they have incredibly distinguishing power to tell you what kind of different re regions of transport you actually have in the system. So I think this is really a new way of probing quantum transport by really being able to measure the full distribution function in the system. Um, yeah, okay, and of course, you know, the question is, can we find interesting transport regimes also in 2D? I think this is really hard also for a theory because numerics in, theory in 2D is of course completely underdeveloped. We don't really have any numerics that could handle even approximately such system sizes that I've been showing you of thousand spins in 2D. There's just nothing there. All right, yeah, so let me give credit to the people who've been doing the work here. So this was mostly uh, uh, the work of, of David here on the uh, KPZ equation, uh, his PhD thesis. All right, uh, just where next, maybe to finish off, um, we're going to talk tomorrow about you know, how to apply all these techniques to, to localization. But there are, of course, many, many other opportunities uh, that uh, people have applied these quantum simulation approaches to the material science one I showed you. There's high energy physics, quantum chemistry, uh, optimization, quantum annealing. Metrology also being be building better clocks, for example, using, using such atoms and lattices and creating uh, interesting entangled states. From challenges from the experimental side is, of course, we want to make these things more programmable, more scalable, reduce uh, any errors that we have in them, have longer coherent time evolutions. This is something that will be very important tomorrow in the MBL questions, where we really want to understand long time dynamics as long as we can in the systems. We want to push the coherent time evolutions, of course, in the system. Just to show you some interesting developments, you know, of, of younger colleagues in the field who are working on this. So, so there's uh, Vasim's group, for example, in Princeton, who's really done very nice work in using these tweezers, combining that with Fermi Hubbard work, where you can realize arbitrary lattice structures by these focused laser beams, but not using Rydberg atoms, but really using these fermionic atoms hopping between one of those lattice sites to the next site. So that's, I think, very nice, promising direction. There's uh, Adam Kaufmann's work on combining uh, these tweezers with the lattice work to make very, very fast cycle times, which as we heard, because of statistics, simply is an important issue for us. If you want to take 100,000 measurements to get to a certain correlation function, you better do it within a short time, otherwise your graduate students will be very angry with you and they won't, don't want to do the measurement if it takes a year to get, take, take that data. Right? So this is really important for pushing the field, so getting to short cycle times. 
and also making these interactions more programmable, for example, by putting the atoms in the cavity and realizing different connectivities, different interactions, is a very new approach with these optical cavities that you can uh, pursue. All right, I think that's all I wanted to tell you for today, and uh, then um, tomorrow we'll talk about MBL, actually how to apply all this stuff to, to, to localization experiments. All right, thank you.